I've seen one of my clients with a hole in his neck so big you can put your fist through it lying on the corridor outside his room in the Lorraine Motor Inn in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I've seen another man bleeding on the steps of his home in Jackson, Mississippi, trying to crawl up the stairs with a bullet in his back, Medgar Evers. Uh, I've seen Viola Liuzzo, not her body, but the effect of her murder while sitting in a car between Selma and Montgomery in Alabama. Uh, a lot of people I've represented, whether it be Malcolm or anybody else, uh, I've seen uh, vanish from the scene under the bullets of assassins. And I've seen a lot of people go rotting in jail who shouldn't be there or who are expatriated or driven uh, into some form of exile uh, because they were standing up for what they believed was right. And so I have tried to sort of make a philosophical basis for enduring all of this. And I have now two that I finally narrowed it down to. When I was in Attica on the last night, Sunday, September 12th, 1971. There was a friend of mine there, some of you may know him and knew him, Sam Melville. Sam Melville was arrested with two other people, a man and a woman. Jane Alpert was one of was the woman for firebombing a chemical bank here in New York as a protest. And he was sent to Attica. And we sat there the last night before the onslaught the next day. And Sam's name was really not Melville, but he took the name from Melville the writer. He took the name because he found in Moby Dick the answer to his philosophical quest. He told me that Herman Melville in Moby Dick was saying something very profound. So I said, what do you mean profound? It's just a whale story. The white whale, Ahab, and I said I had seen the movie, not Gregory Peck, but John Barrymore. Most of you saw Gregory Peck. I happen to be a little older than I guess most people here. To me, it was John Barrymore. But in any event, he said, no, it's not just a whale story. It's a story of evil. The white whale, he said, in Melville's terms, swims on unconquering and unconquerable. And the question is, if the white whale represents evil, it seems to destroy everybody. The Pequot, Ahab is lashed to the whale's back and drowns. The men in the open boat are swept into oblivion by the swish of the whale's tail. But one man goes back to sea. Ishmael, the cabin boy, is saved. He floats to safety on the coffin of Tashtengo, the Indian. And he goes back to sea. He said, that's what Herman Melville meant that you fight evil, you lose a lot along the way, but there's always someone to go back. There's always an Ishmael to go back to see. Unfortunately, his head was blown off his shoulders the next morning by double O buckshot as the troopers stormed in to D yard at 8.45 on September 13th, 1971. The second is the concept of the Statue of David. Uh, I saw the Statue of David for the first time in Florence, in the Academia, in the 50s, when I went to Italy. And to me, it was just a beautiful statue of a young man. The musculature, all beautifully portrayed. I was standing next to the statue when a man spoke to me and said, young man, he seemed to be pretty old at that time, though he's probably 20 years younger than I am now. He said, young man, he said, you know what that statue means, what Michelangelo was trying to do. I said, it's beautiful. Look at the eyes, the rock in the right hand, the sling over the left shoulder. He's looking out toward Goliath leading the Philistine down the hills of Galilee toward the Israelites. And he said, that's just, just a beautiful statue. Michelangelo is saying to all of us over 300 years or so, he's saying, this is a young man 
who is thinking of taking a chance with his life. It's the only portrayal in art, he said, of the David Goliath story done before Goliath is killed. All the rest, Donatello's bronze, and the rest show David holding up the severed hand of the dead giant in triumph on his way toward historical greatness. But here, he said, he's thinking about doing it. He's one of many shepherd boys on the hills. If he doesn't do it, no one will think the worst of him. No one will even know it crossed his head. He's saying to himself, like Prufrock, I guess, in the Eliot poem, do I dare, do I dare? He said, this is the point in everybody's life where a moment comes when you may have to jeopardize yourselves in one way or another. It may not be as fantastic as Philistines coming down 6th Avenue here, uh, led by giants, and so on. But you'll know it when it comes. And you'll know you were tested, and you made it or you didn't make it. He said, that's what Michelangelo is saying. He's saying, David, are you going to do it? If you do it and you miss, or you don't kill him, you're one dead shepherd boy in these hills. If you do it and you win, you're a hero to your people. And you saved your lives, your life and theirs as well. And that stuck in my mind. The man I learned, a lane, learned, a lane, learned that later learned was Bernard Berenson, who I found out was the world's authority on Renaissance art and who died several years later. That has always been my motto now. If anybody come to my office, as Dennis Roberts did the other day, he knows there's a statue of David that I bought at the Spanish Steps in Rome, about two and a half feet long or high, that I have. The only problem with it has been when we have Islamic clients come to the office with their daughters, we have to turn the statue around. <laughs> Apparently the rear is okay, but the front is verboten. <laughs> I must tell you one thing that Michelangelo may have been a great sculptor, but he did not know a Hebraic custom of circumcision because his David is not circumcised. But that's, a, I guess, a passing fancy anyway. In any event, I'd like to end, seeing I'm close to my time, with a, a short poem by G.K. Chesterton. It comes from a poem called The Vision of the King and it's, I love literary references because they, they say a lot in a few words and make me feel good in the morning, sometimes in the evening as well. The G.K. Cheston wrote this poem about the Battle of Athelney when the Saxon king, Harold, uh, was defeated by the Danes. And he has the king in his tent cleaning his sword. They're always cleaning their sword, you know, in these situations. And the Virgin Mary comes to see him and tells him he's going to be sliced up the next morning for hash by the Danes. But that life will go on and the struggle will go on. This is, this poem, these eight lines or so, were the only editorial in the London Times on the editorial page the day after the last soldiers, French and British, were evacuated from Dunkirk in 1940. You remember the Wehrmacht came down, isolated them near Dunkirk, and by a heroic effort of private boats, naval vessels, they managed to extricate the 300,000 men so they could fight another day, uh, as they did, and bring them back to England. And this poem appeared as the only editorial. It was all a blank white page, except for these eight or so lines that come out of the battle, The Vision of the King by G.K. Cheston. And this is the Virgin Mary speaking to, G.K. Ch uh, to King Harold, telling him he's going to be killed, but that there's another day that will come. And she says to him this, I tell you, naught for your comfort, yea, naught for your desire. Say that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises ever higher. Night shall be thrice night over you, 
and heaven an iron cope? Do you have joy without cause and faith without hope? Thank you. Ooh, is that all right? Too literary? No, always. If you guys think it's something other than straightforward garbage. You can see America in the Courts each week at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on our companion network, C-SPAN.